You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Ryan, hi. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Your hair is a little longer. It is. It grows fast. It's been a month. Yeah. Yeah. Is it time for a haircut? Uh, it'll be time for a haircut at the beginning of June so that it grows out at a reasonable length for people- my sister's wedding. Oh, but, congratulations. I don't want to have like a too short haircut. I want it to be like a... Do you think people are excited to hear about your hair right now? Yes. Especially if they're listening. Uh, great episode. Before we start it, uh, you're going to love this one. I'm so glad. I was a, such a big fan of hers. Still am a big fan of hers after this interview. Um, Paul Abdul. But before you fast forward, um, I just let you know that uh, patreon.com slash talk uh, inside of you. <laughs> patreon.com slash inside of you to support the podcast. I thank you all the patrons for really supporting this and keeping it going. I want to do it. I'd love to do it forever. So if you want it to continue and you're liking these interviews, uh, support us if you can. And uh, if you can't, at least uh, listen and uh, write a review. Follow us on our handles, Ryan. At Inside of You Pod on Twitter, at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Yes, that's right. Uh, inside of You Online Store, I still have a few of those Lex Luthor statues. They just went on sale. They're bronze. They're art pieces. I signed them. They're numbered. There's only nine. I think there's like four left. And if you want one, get one. But there's a lot of other cool stuff. Autograph Lexmas scripts and talk for, or Inside of You mugs and... and uh, tons of stuff so get there inside of you online store and uh also i'm going to be in tidewater and then i'm gonna, in virginia beach for a con i'm going to be in uh, niagara falls coming up i'm going to be in philly um so get out there to see me damn it welling and i will be in philly to do a uh, a smallville nights in a con and drink some water yeah have a philly cheesesteak oh yeah what am I doing that accent? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Paula Abdul, what can I say about her? I mean, I just love Rush, Rush, want to hear you breathe with me. I have so many songs that I just love that she did. And um, she has so many great stories that I had no idea. Her Laker story is unreal. Um, I think we should just get into it. Um, all my love to you guys. Let's just let's just rock into this. No, no too much talking. Let's get inside of Paula freaking Abdul. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. Ryan, before you got here, I was doing my research, you know, my quick kind of like scan of the earth for my guests to see, you know, what they've done. And obviously we know some of what you've done, but it's like endless, the amount of shit you've done. <laughs> I mean, don't you ever get tired? Um, Yeah, I do. But I figure I'll sleep a whole bunch later on when I go. <laughs> do you sleep well? Um, That's a really, I have not slept at all. Like last night I was, I was up all night, like bad insomnia. I go through bouts of insomnia like every six weeks or so. And it usually lasts like two to three days. And I'm a zombie. So I was like, going, of all days, I'm coming here for my first podcast. You don't look like a zombie. You're the most beautiful zombie I've ever seen. Well, you're so kind. That should be a movie, Beautiful Zombie. Has yes. it already been done? Probably. Apocalypse Zombie, I'm sure that's been done. Um, <laughs> She's just bloated, <laughs> bloated. Bloated zombie? Yes, I think that's been done. I think that's my brother. <laughs> bloated zombie. Hey, he, looked fat little, self. he looked a little bloated the other day. Hey, fatty. We were in Vegas. Oh, yeah, I said that. We were talking about uh, that's an inside joke. That's just like, you know. Did you be honest about this? Did you always have like aspirations of being like a rock star and this amazing dancer, choreographer? Did you even dream about that as a kid? Or was it something that just kind of kept happening? This is crazy because let me. Back it up. I was born three months premature. I weighed 2.8 pounds. I had terrible hip dysplasia. And in dance, you have to have turned out hips. But I had braces on my legs, completely inverted. Like old school like braces. Old school. I had. I was born with a broken windpipe. So the, almost the first three full years of my life, I was the first fainting goat. Like I was fainted all the time. If I wake up when you, baby cries, they make the face... And they, it's an inhale, and I couldn't even hold that, so I would pass out. What? Right? Yeah, I'm, and I have a sister who's seven years older than I am. Her name's Wendy. I love her to death. But because I was the freak of nature that came along, ruined her life because she's seven and a half, and now this little peanut that everyone's afraid to touch, and she can't play with me. But what was cool 
is that she would escape the dinner table and go into my room and provoke me to wake up because she was adamant that, damn it, I'm going to play with my baby sister. But what she did, which was interesting, and the doctor said, like, she just taught you a co- like a life coping me- mechanism. As soon as she provoked me to wake up and I'd make that face go, <gasps> she'd go tickle me and she'd go, Bleh! and she'd tickle me and I'd wait. <clears throat> you remember this? This is, no, this is what I was told. This is what you're told us. Gosh. And, and laughing is an exhale where crying is an inhale. <laughs> it is. Isn't you that can't crazy? Go. <laughs> well, you can if you do the, that oh, kind yeah, of laugh, yeah, you don't know? Do the snorts. But, Oh, sometimes I do it. Do you kinda, snort or you snort her? Sometimes it just kind of leaks out of of a laugh and it's embarrassing. It catches me by surprise. But <laughs> I learn to laugh all the time. So when I get punished, I'd laugh. That's not good. But seriously, like I was four years old. I do remember, I do remember glimpses of this. And my family sat down to watch an MGM musical called Singing in the Rain. Oh yeah. And I remember seeing, because it's something that ignited, in, like it's, that spark ignited and changed my life. At four years old, I remember walking up to the TV set and pointing the TV set going, that's my dad, to Gene Kelly. And my dad behind on the couch said, no, I'm your father. That could be your TV dad. And at that point, my family said that, I said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be that. At four years old, I knew what my life calling was, and I never looked back. I like I knew, like a child believes in Santa Claus, that that's what I was going to do. So you had everything going against you, but you're like, you're four years old, and you look at the TV and it's singing in the rain. And you're like, oh, this is me as a little kid. At four years old, Ryan, what are you doing? I'm going, you know, my dad's, you know, looking at me like, what the, what's wrong with you? <laughs> that's what I always, I was, what's wrong with me? That's the big question. I always was wondering as a kid, what is wrong with me? Why do they keep asking me that? What the hell's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Why are you doing that? I don't know. And so I felt like finally acting was sort of a home where I could kind of be anything I wanted to be and be provocative and, and get away with it. I'm an actor. I can do whatever the hell I want, mm-hmm. sort of. Um, but you sort of know, so so take me through, or were you starting like always dancing in the house and playing uh, around and? Well, okay, so. Were your parents cool? Did you have good parents? Okay, so let me tell you, great parents. Both completely like served a major purpose in my life. My mom was tough love. My mother was uh, one of the most celebrated pianists and she learned to play by key and she was celebrated in, she's Canadian. In the, in the Philharmonics on radio shows. And the first thing she said to my sister and I, you can play any instrument, but you're not playing the piano. Cause she didn't want to have the headache of hearing. My mom is born with per- perfect pitch. And the best thing, just smash cut to, when my mom would come to American Idol, I could see her peripherally. And if I heard one of the contestants go sharp or flat, I would look at my mom and this is, my mom would go like this. <laughs> her eye would just her eye would twitch. twitch. And, um, but so my mom was very particular that you're not playing the piano. So my sister took up guitar and I decided I'm going to play the tuba. <laughs> you played the tuba? No, that was a disaster. <laughs> then I went to upright bass. You're so small. <laughs> I, I, upright bass. I just leaned it against the wall. Okay, and, good. But then I fell in love with the flute. And in orchestra and band, I'd be fainting all the time. And the rest of the class would be counting, like wagering bets of, okay, how long is she going to be out for it? Let's like From just playing the flute? Cut breath. You lose your breath, breath and you pass breath. out. Dancing, pass out. I'm telling you, crazy. Well, I constantly pass out. Yeah, it's um, it was it was really weird. You are that fainting goat. I What's the first fainting goat? Is that what it is or a sheep? It's a goat. It's a goat. Yeah, it's a goat. It's a goat. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, um, it's a goat, sweetie. It's a goat. <laughs> but, but the craziest thing is, this is shows the tenacity of of, of a, a fighter because I fought it from birth. I became first chair flautist all throughout junior high and high school, and um, I was determined. Like you know, certain things I couldn't do in PE class because I couldn't run. It just, but I learned to have create my own style of dance because because of my body and having the hip dysplasia Mm -hmm. i never was born with with the extension and the flexibility as dancers 
but I had a keen mind that would dream like full blown production numbers in my sleep and and like like in Polaroid pictures, you know, or I say Polaroid pictures. Polaroid, you get that, Ryan? My my mom was tough love. She worked for the studios. Um, so she worked for the president of United Artists and Warner Brothers. And so she saw a gazillion young girls, ingenues, all these people who want to make it and the hardship of it. And my family, they're doctors and lawyers. And it's like, you're going to go to school to be that. And I would say, okay, but not really. And my dad was the other one who said, as a little girl, God damn it, you're an Abdul. You can do anything you goddamn want to do. And I thought, God damn, it's like the coolest thing. I was good. And then. God damn, you're an Abdul. So here's the perfect visual of my mom and my dad. I'm I'm in first grade and I'm starring in the spring musical called Jill in the Box. And I'm messing up. And I look out into the audience and I see my mom like this. Oh, God. Nightmare. And this is my dad. Gets up. He's going, excuse me. And he's passing by people excuse me excuse me and i'm watching my dad and now he's walking towards the stage and now he's on the side of the wings and he's going get over, get over here and i'm like shuffling off the buffalo to my dad on the stage while on you're the performing stage, you go over uh, to your father I, 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 and he goes god damn it go out there and show him who you are you're a goddamn abdul i went okay okay my dad was my cheerleader my mom was just wanting to make sure that her daughter doesn't get overwhelmed with rejection from trying to make it in the business. And my dad always said, God damn it, you can do whatever you want. But he did tell me at nine years old, because I'd say, Dad, I'm going to make it one day. I don't know how, but somehow I'm going to make it. And he said, honey, I, I think we need to talk. You're not going to be the obvious choice in the nicest way. He's trying to tell me, you're never going to fit the mold. And I'm listening to him intently. He goes, you're going to get rejected, which means you're going to feel bad, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Just remember this. No is the beginning of a negotiation. Oh my God. <laughs> At eight and a half turning nine. And I carried it with me for the rest of my life. Jesus. Were you? I... But I have to tell you one. Uh, can I just tell you the crazy aspect of where I grew up? Yeah. North Hollywood. And I was in a three three condominium compound, right where the old Van Nuys and Victory Drive-In was, Coldwater. And this is crazy. Uh, we lived in the middle condominium. Our condominium was separated by a pool. And my sister's high school boyfriend, I was seven. My sister was at Grant High School. And her boyfriend was this genius savant drummer, like incredible. His older brother or cousin, I don't, someone how related to him was the band leader. So there's a little nepotism going on, but they're like my sister, white Jewish kid named Mark Sanders, great guy. And one day he gets a phone call from the band leader saying, my old college roommate, don't know if you remember him, he's now the MD of the Jacksons. They're opening up at the MGM Grand. The MD? Mm -hmm. What's MD? Musical director. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, well, I should know that probably, shouldn't I? Anyway. Well, you know ahead. what an AD is. So I'm, I knew what an I, MC was. I wonder if she met MC. No, so the musical MD. director. Right, right. Not a doctor either. Yes. No, not a doctor. <laughs> was it a doctor? A doctor of music. <laughs> a doctor, um, well. But uh, Mark said, well, I'm white and I'm Jewish. <laughs> and, and they go, yeah, we're well aware of it. And they're fine with that. And my mother loaded up the station wagon. He learned the entire set for the Jacksons. They were opening up at the MGM Grand. We drove in the station wagon. My very first concert at seven years old was the Jacksons. 10 years later, I'm a Laker girl and I'm choreographing their world tour, the reunion tour with Michael. This episode of Inside of You is brought to you by Better help better help online therapy so many people have come to me at these cons telling me better help is really changing their life is really helping them and it means a ton to me that they're you know using something that i promote um and it's just such it's so good for you and uh, you know a lot of people ryan 
you know, I don't want people to, I can deal with my problems. I, I'm, I got it. And they just bottle up, man. And when it gets too much, it, you'll, you implode. You, you just, you know, we all need therapy. You, you go to therapy. Yeah. You continue to go to therapy. It's like, yeah, it's like a weekly sort of release valve. It just, is. That's a good way of looking yeah. at it. Yeah. Um, look, with everything happening around us, it could be hard to focus on our well-being. Many are stretched thin and burned out from burning the candle at both ends. I know I do that. You know, you got so much going on, you think you can handle it. And uh, that's where therapy comes in. Caring, compassionate listeners like those at BetterHelp.com. This totally online source for therapy has helped thousands find peace of mind and direction during these trying times. BetterHelp.com understands we all need to develop better coping skills and ways to set boundaries to empower us to become the best versions of ourselves. Let me recommend BetterHelp.com if you've considered trying therapy. After a brief questionnaire, and it is brief, trust me, it's quick. Yeah, I don't like long stuff. You'll be matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch at any time at no charge. That's the thing. I think people are like, what if I don't like my therapist? It's so easy. Done. New one. See ya. Get someone you vibe. If you have to go through five, so be it. Find more balance with better help. Visit BetterHelp.com slash inside today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash inside. Do you know everybody? Oh, it's almost like it's really like one of those. It's like the Jack Nicholson stories and like, but the Paula Abdul is all it, it's it's wedged in history as like that almost like folklore. That thing was like. She was a Laker girl. Paul Abdul was a Laker girl. And that's what started a career and all these things. And I, whenever I go to the game, I always laugh. I go, I want to be the guy who announces the Laker girls. This is all he does. Literally he goes, Laker girls. Yes. That's all he does. It's a famous Lawrence Tanner. Is LP that his name? Tanner. Yeah. Laker girls. You know how I became a Laker girl? Uh, you're hot and you could dance. Hardly. Hardly. Well, I could dance. Um, <laughs> this was fun, a fun story. Again, not the obvious choice. I used to teach dance in cheerleading camps when I was a teenager. And some of the girls that were on staff with me, 17, 17 years old, the, these beautiful five foot seven, you know, the figure for days, blonde hair, blue eyes. They come and they go, hey, Polly, do you want to try out to be a Laker girl with us? And I'd look up at them. I go, no. They go, why not? Because I'm... I don't look like you. I, I don't fit the mold. But you're so good, Paula. Come on. What do you have to lose? And that was a challenge to me. I said, nothing, I suppose. And uh, four girls picked me up. We carpooled all the way to the. None of them got it. You got it. Well, no. But I, you had to be 18. I was 17 and a half. Okay. So I remember when we got down there, I bought a dance bag with me. And I noticed the other girls didn't. They just had their leotards and we were walking in and I was number, we were in the 700s. There were close to 2000 girls and they'd line up a hundred at a time at the forum. And I was 742 and the other four girls were relatively around that number with me. And I remember on my toes and I'm, I'm hitting my hips and I'm, they go, okay, if we call your number, please step forward. And numbers are being called. And then two of my friends, like one after another, got called. And I'm going, and I'm like, yeah, like that. And then my number's called. And the other two girls weren't called. And I'm just going, oh, my God. And I'm on my tiptoes. They go, uh, state your name. I go, Paula Abdul. Spell it A-B-D-U-L. Like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Sure, whatever. They go, how tall are you? I go, five foot two. <laughs> I'm five foot nothing. So lie, 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 lie. But this is the coolest part. I think we're going to be able to dance and move forward and the rest are going to be cut. You hear the voice from God going, all right, ladies, we have to thin the herd. If we called your number, thank you for coming down. Come back next season and try out. Wait, you were the guys, the girls that weren't? Weren't, didn't even get to dance, okay? I am like going, I can't believe I didn't even get to dance. Aren't you guys pissed that now, Three of us were cut, two girls. So the, the two girls I thought were being cut, they're left. And I just go, I'll be right back. I went into the bathroom because no, I had a plan. You didn't I didn't change your outfit. I certainly did. I put on a different leotard. 
I put, I got a different number. I had my hair down, so now what am I? Oh, I'm gonna put it in a ponytail, and I entered as my middle name Julie. You cheater! And I spelled my last name A B B A L. Funniest thing is there's there was a guy that actually saw me do this, and I'm going, how in the hell can one person hone in looking at me and laughing? And I went out of the bathroom, and the two girls that were cut with me, they're like, I, you can't do it. And I went, bye, and I ran out onto the forum floor right up to my two friends are there, and they're all they're negotiating. You can't do that, Paula. This, this is against the rules. I go, my dad taught me if it's not written in the rules, there are no rules. My yeah, dad, and you're already cut. What could you, wait, what wait, could you lose? Yeah. Right. So I, I entered as my middle name, Julie Abel, new number, put my hair in a ponytail. I got to dance. And all three of us got cut. So now all five of us are done, gonzo. And all that they're pissed off is that the two girls that originally got cut are mad at me. Now the other two girls, are, they're mad at me. And I'm going, aren't you mad that we got cut? And I said, guys, please, can you just wait one more round? I still have one more outfit. No, come on. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Did you, did you know this? She changed into another effing out. Oh, but I saved the best for last. What did you put well, on? Well, first of all, I said, can you wait? And they said, hell no. You can take a taxi or a bus. And I went, really? They go, really? And I went, okay. I went back into the stall. This time, I saved the best for last. I, the old Jane Fonda red and white chevron stripe leotard. Ooh, I want to see pictures. Blue leg warmers. Oh, no, I don't. You were 17. I don't want to see pictures. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> wristbands. <laughs> And now I had a headband like Olivia Newton-John, and I'm like, okay, dear God, please, I got to get this. I got to become a Laker girl. I got to I gotta prove to my dad, like, as if this is going to make my career. Little did I know. Uh, I ran out there, and as I was running out of the bathroom, oh, I entered my first initial P, my middle initial J, J spelled my last name Apple, A-P-P-L-E. Paula Julie Apple. Apple. And what am I going to do with my hair? I've worn it down. I put it in a ponytail. I'm going to put half up and half down with a hair scrunchie. I started the worst hair craze ever. The half up, half down palm tree on the head. It all started as me trying to figure out how I could look different to be a Laker girl. Got a different number. As I ran out of the bathroom, I heard back half of the arena come forward and the front half go back. And it was perfect. I just... Ran to the front in the middle. This guy is still laughing at me. A gun guy who ended up being an intern from UCLA who got the job of, of being in charge of the Laker girls. His name was Lon Rosen. I know Lon. Lon Rosen was my first boss. Well, I swear to God. I know Lon. He started Lon as an intern. Just, he's a good guy to know. He got me uh, Dodger tickets. Yes, because he's been, he's, he, he's been he, in the business managed, a long time. He, as her intern, then stuck with magic became his agent his manager like and and has everything to do with the dodgers and it's just crazy so i got to dance and then i heard front half of the arena go back and back half go front and at that moment i'm pivoting i'm going i'm going they're going to forget about me god damn it they're going to forget about me and i said i promised to god i'd be bold and daring and i literally turned around and i ran back, squirmed my way to the front and center, and Lon was laughing. And uh, that's how I made it. I got the third attempt. You? I mean, and I became the tenacity, but that's guts, risk-taking. Here's the difference. You, you notice this, because I like to get in mental health and stuff like that on this podcast, because a lot of people go through it, and a lot of people really respond, yep. and we face adversity, we face, and it's, uh, the stigma's going away with mental health, and I like that, finally. But we have a long way to go. But I yes. look at you as like this young teenage girl who's just going for it and, and has just no fear, very little fear. And let me ask you, why is it that when we get older, oh. it creeps up on us? Like all this confidence and all these things that we exude, like that make us who we are, it's then the start peeling us or breaking us down. It's the most difficult thing to sustain because when we start, we we don't care how we do it. We are just going to figure out how to how become. To make it. So you have reckless abandon, and you have that 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 I have nothing to lose, and so you don't. Then when you start becoming famous and recognized, you start having things to lose, 
And then it chips away at that reckless abandon and that that what do I have to lose mentality. And it's the hardest thing to combat, but it, you have to find a balance in that. Otherwise, Can you come back from it? Yes. Can you really come back from it and be stronger even than you were? Well, that's called uh, having the ebbs and flows in your career and uh, and creating renaissances of reinvention and all the time. And I, I've been that girl, you know? The ebb, you certainly the have. Flows. And I've gone through tremendous adversity and you know when i stayed i stayed i was made the head laker girl and choreographer right away because the girl who was in charge named Lori ryan um fell in love with another basketball player and got traded and um i think that was the story and she was moving so immediately i i took over and i was of course i was like the, the little short one, right? In the I'm front. probably nervous. Like, oh my gosh, I'm. This is a big, you know. You know what? I, I knew that I. I always knew that I had a gift of creation and and forming something. Like, like okay, so in my condominium. Not only did Mark Sanders, my sister's boyfriend, go on to be a fam famous musician, and the Jacksons and all that. Two doors down were these two brothers named the Picaro brothers. What who formed you, you didn't Toto? Know I'm good Toto. buddies with Steve. I, I hate name dropping. Is this correct? Okay. Steve was on the podcast, but the, look, Picara brothers were just genius. genius. Toto. I mean, they started that band when they were in and high school. And then there school. were four college roommates in the first condominium that ended up becoming members of the, the Tower Power Horn section. So this is all in my North Hollywood. And I'm a girl, little girl who would get, I would get the musicians and go into the playground at the back of the three condominiums. And I'd, I'd, direct and produce the spring musicals and the Christmas plays. And I had a knack for putting things together, organizing and seeing a full That picture. was your gift. You that knew you gift. had a gift for that. Yeah. For seeing things and creating things and movement and all these things. There's, there's one person that I left out that was very- um, Influential? Well, how do I say influential? I couldn't stand him. He was my babysitter. <laughs> um, I was seven years old. My my sister and her best friend Maureen worked at this in the mall, this store called Contempo Cash. By the way, drink some water. You haven't stopped talking. I feel bad you're talking so I'm, much. Are you am I if if and if I'm if I'm overwhelming or boring, just let No, me this is awesome. I just was like, I feel bad because I keep like throwing this stuff at you. No. You just want to open up about it. I love it. The babysitter. The babysitter. So my sister's best friend Maureen, they they worked at a place called Contempo Casuals, which was a clothing store, very hip back in, in the Laurel Canyon Mall. Okay, the Laurel Plaza, whatever. Um, so when they when they were working, I'd have I my I'd my mom would have to get a babysitter. But see, my sister's best friend Maureen had a boyfriend who was an aspiring aspiring singer songwriter from Westport, Connecticut. And in the summers, he'd come out and he'd spend half the time with Maureen and her family, his girlfriend's family. You're waiting to see who this and is. And the other half, he, he would also stay with my sister and hang out. They were best friends. And I used to hate when he babysit me because he's an aspiring singer songwriter. He would always go, "I'm just gonna be outside." I, mean, I know he's gonna be with the Parcaro, but he's gonna be with the musicians. They're gonna, and he pays no attention to me. And I remember I was so angry at him at seven years old. I'm I'm a brown, in my brownie uniform and I'm doing my homework on an L shaped couch. And he goes to leave, and I ran on my knees to lock him out. But my pencil from doing my homework it was stuck up in between the cushions, went into my knee. And this aspiring singer-songwriter who had his driver's permit, I had to get stitches in my knee. His name was Michael Bolotin, who became Michael Bolton. I can't, make, can't the, make this shit up. I can't up. make this shit up. This podcast is brought to you by Dove Men Plus Care. Guys, do you get distracted during the day thinking about your underarms sweating or itching or emitting an odor? Ugh. Do those thoughts keep you from showing care when it counts? New and improved Dove Men Plus Care Antiperspirant with 72-hour sweat and odor protection and one-quarter moisturizing cream helps you forget about your underarms so you can be present for the moments that matter. Don't let underarm insecurities keep you at arm's distance from the ones you care about. Buy new and improved Dove Men Plus Care Antiperspirant wherever personal care products are sold.
This message is sponsored by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection? The latest innovation from Discover. Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. Michael Bolton was your babysitter. Bolton. Now smash cut to years later, all of a sudden straight up is the number one single. How can I get... Sorry. Yes. Damn. But yes. remember, he used to babysit me and sing me lullabies to Beatles songs. And Probably he, kept you up with that and, voice. It, and he'd sing, he'd <laughs> sing and use farm animals for twist and shout. He'd do twist and moo or... <laughs> Are you still friends with him? Okay, so all these years go by. You dated him. Oh God, no. Okay, all right. Well, I mean, you know, once that's that, that's the funny part because I can't make this shit up. No, I'm driving it, and straight up is now number one single. We are driving. My sister and I are getting our nails done on Sunset at Jessica Nail Salon. We are passing at right at a light before Tower Records. My sister goes, "Oh my God." The whole side of the wall is my album. I'd never seen anything like that. The whole, like big, the whole Forever Your Girl album. Oh my god! And an at album. the at the red light next to me, you hear straight up being blasted, and these girls are are like lip syncing and scream. And then they see me, and I they see me and scream. I go ah! And my sister's going, "This is so weird," because I was Wendy Abdul's little sister all the time. It was just a weird transition when this happened because I love that. now it's so crazy we pass the light and we're laughing because it's so, just bizarre still I'm trying to get used to the fact that my song's on the radio and she flips the station and we it's a ballad my sister goes do you remember Belotin I go yeah she goes this kind of sounds like him very distinct voice right they back announced, and that was Michael Bolton from the Hunger album. My sister turns the car around, pulls into Tower Records. We go right in, straight to Michael Bolton. And there's his bin, and he has the same damn mullet hairdo that he, that had. he had. It's him. At the same exact time, with my little flip phone, I get a call from my one of my good friends, Julie, who became the first ever dance agent. She goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm, Wendy and I are getting our nails done. I go, why don't you meet us? She goes, I'll see if I can get an appointment. She goes, I have something weird to tell you. I just got a call from a manager uh, named Mr. Levin, Louis Levin. And he has a client. And the first thing he says, you need to, can you please find out if, if she's the brat that he used to babysit? I go, huh? She goes, a guy named Michael, well, I go, I'm standing in front of his bin. I go, Julie, I'm putting on speaker. Wendy, come over here. Come over what, here. What, what? Yeah. And I go, say what you just said, Julie. A guy, a manager who has a, uh, an artist, uh, he, his name is Michael B Bolton. And, and I go, Julie, I'm standing in front of his bin. She, I go, tell him I'm not the brat. She goes, wait a minute. He babysat you? I go, get the guy. I'm not kidding. My sister and I, I said, I'll meet at the Sunset Marquee, he wants me at 4 p.m. My sister and I hadn't seen him since I was seven, since she was 17, 18 And you old. went and had lunch? No, we went to the Sunset Marquee at 4 p.m. He came out of the elevator. He sees my sister and I, drops to his knees. And we ended up staying and talking till four in the morning. And it ended up being, wait a minute. He, he was like, you little shit. My whole career, I've been, I am just now having a hit like with adult contemporary and your album has to be out and he goes you little shit and i go sorry it's sorry. and i go what do you i go what is what you want me to choreograph you like he goes well yeah you, i go my sister goes you have no rhythm if i can recall correctly and i just started laughing and and he goes you gotta give me something and then he goes and by the way i'm nominated at the american music awards will you be my date he's nominated for best new male artist and I go, ew, my sister's laughing. And then it was just, come on, do it. What Fine. are the odds of this? I, I'm his date for the American Music Awards. What does Dick Clark give me as a category? Best new male artist. 
I was laughing and went, Michael Bolton. I announced his win. It's first, it's first American musical. Win. This universe is small, as vast as it appears to be. It's amazing how it's like Celestine prophecy shits. It, it is. It's weird kind of this energy that we create, and it's. But this is a this qu- this didn't happen when I was a kid. I grew up somewhere where the guy behind me was caught in an aluminum shredder and died. <laughs> Another guy went to prison. Another guy uh, went to prison for you know killing somebody. Uh, there was uh, there was no cr- a lot of very no creativity where I grew up in Indiana. The fact that I got out and there was like I can't go. And then who do I bump into? The guy who murdered the guy in high school. <laughs> Yeah, and then they, his parole officer asked me to come over <laughs> and talk. Anyway, um, you and I share something that um, you could elaborate on. But I have, uh, since I was 18, I've had a lot of surgeries. Mm-hmm. I've had a lot of chronic pain. I've dealt with chronic pain my entire life. I've had eight. I, we're no, one, no, one, no one understands it. No one understands it. Unless they've it. gone through it. No one gets it. I... um. Like I said, six lower back surgeries, fusion, fusion in my neck, you know, sports and that. And I still function and I, I try not to talk about it. I don't like to, you know, right. bother people about it. Um, I've had my times where um, I, I've just thought of giving up in terms of like, you know, I don't the pain's been at certain points in my life. Um, I've tried everything. I might try the stem cell thing. Um, I've been, you know, I've been stuck on pills for a while and then I get through that somehow and then and ultimately i figure out that that doesn't work it's just numbing Mm. the pain and masking once it it goes into acute pain no one no like i was i've never been contrary to what people believe and how they made me to look on american idol without letting me know the red lights on and me i'm a goofy girl i'm needless to say i haven't even gotten into american idol but pain is daunting and it's isolating and you may not like look how awful you feel and the quality of your life becomes something that is so abnormal and your pain tolerance, it it's just horrible. And I, you know, I've gone through 15 cervical spinal surgeries. 15. Yes. Now, let I, I want to get this out here because people go, she did, there's no record of her ever getting in a crash landing and a I was on tour, my first world tour, big tour, the biggest tour, uh, touring act, and I was at the height, height, height of outselling a lot of artists, and I was leaving from St. Louis, going to Denver in a seven-seater jet, private jet, and 30 minutes, 35 minutes into the air, I had just gone to the bathroom and climbed over luggage to get back to my seat, never got to my seat. One of the engines blew up and the right wing caught on fire and we plummeted. And I hit the top of my head on the plane and I was knocked out. Um, I, People say, she's making this up. Well, you know what, these young reporters don't realize, while I was on tour, there was no computer. There were no paparazzi. It was tabloid reporting and after watching the horrific spinal cord injuries that Gloria Stefan went through. Mm, car crash. For me, I did my whole career by myself. I didn't have anyone I could go to and say, what was it like for you? Because I started at 17 working with the most genius, egomaniacal, like egomaniacal genius. Uh, I helped win Academy Awards for these directors and producers, Tony Awards, Emmys. Mm-hmm. I worked with the cream of the crop from the time I was 17 years old. And and all of a sudden now I'm in this in this crazy accident when when I came to the plane was in flames. And there were six other people on the plane that experienced this too. There's no reason I would make this up and have to lose my career at the biggest catalog Why selling art. Because this? it's because it's not documented in 
in in because a private plane that and was... because I was able to have people sign NDAs, I didn't want anyone to know that I might perhaps be damaged goods. I worked really hard to get the career that that I have. Did you go right to the hospital? I was. I woke up in in, in the hospital. I I I was. God bless Merv Griffin's crew saw that a private plane went down that it was mine, and they rescued us and and in a cornfield and I just I remember coming to and like my tour manager was a guy named Marty Hom and I had this incredible manager Bob Cavallo who was ma managing Prince at the time and and you know wait I, a minute I you know the first thing I think of Ryan I know people are thinking about it because I I'm a little uh morbid at times but I I want to know what you're thinking when you're looking what you remember as you're going down your your heart rate your your mind the thoughts that go through your mind because m most people don't survive a plane crash at least as far as no, i know and i was so the what, only one that didn't have seat, a seat and so what on. were you thinking right before you remember waking up what right before, i don't remember anything that's do, the do thing. you remember anything in the plane i i remember climbing over i remember seeing an illumination of light and i saw my hair and makeup artist who was i had my hair and makeup artist my tour manager my tour accountant, um, I'm missing some people here. Uh, I remember seeing um, my hair and makeup guy, Daniel, uh, a light just illuminate his face and I, I saw fear of God and I, I must have got hit with my head and I was knocked out. You were surprised you, you, you lived. Well, not when I came, I came to and, and we were all holding hands. Like, I'm going, wait, it's not our turn to go, this is crazy. And we, the co-pilot was able to crash land us. Did anybody die? Nobody died. Um, some we, people had stitches from a from a gash over forehead, a uh, gash on the knee. Um, but I was the only one that That's got spinal insane. cord injury. And the thing, you wanna hear a crazy thing? I, I was, I had already started a lot of my tour. I had a really incredible um, agent. He wasn't even my agent at CAA, a guy named Kevin Hubain who just believed in me. And this is after the tremendous success of Bodyguard. He said, I just, watching Paul in her video, she's an actress. I, you know, I want I want to gun for her. I was a, a client at CAA and I just had a music agent, you know, Rob Light and at CAA, but Kevin Huvane kind of championed me and got me in to read for a film. And it was the late Howard Fuhrer, who is the casting director. And I was told that Academy Award winning Australian director Stephen Frears is directing. And I'm gonna give you the punchline at the end, but I started coming in and they would fly me on the Northern part of my tour. I was going San Jose, they'd fly me back in at Paramount and I would be reading with with Stephen Frears, with, with um, Howard Fuhrer and I'd see different actresses from Patricia Arquette and Winona, like a lot of people. And I keep getting flown back to, now I'm, I'm, I'm screen testing. And I keep getting called back. And now it was down to two people, another actress and me. Who was the actress, do you remember? Rosie Perez. Rosie Perez. So now here's what happened. I screen tested with Jeff Bridges. I kept getting called back. It was just the weirdest thing. So now it was down to the two of us and pa Paramount, I hadn't done anything. So they were skeptical and they sent um, Howard Fine at the time, a late uh, acting coach and a woman named Janet Alhanti who had contracts with Paramount and wanted to know what their opinion was because they, the, they got the nod from, you know, from Howard, from, from Stephen, but I understood. I didn't, I have nothing that I've proven myself with. So guess what? I'm I have a day off in Denver. So I'm flying from St. Louis after my concert to Denver. Half hour in, I get in the plane crash landing. Wake up in the hospital. All I wake up to, I said, get me out of the hospital. I have to get to the hotel room because they were flying Howard and, and Janet Ahanti, the two acting coaches who paramount. And it was from the movie Fearless. Jeff Bridges, the plane crash movie. And I'm going, method acting, method acting. Okay, <laughs> this is my role. This is my role. Oh, my God. But. Rosie Perez. No, plus the fact that 
with I had a cartoon lump on my head, like seriously, a cartoon that lump. That big. It, and um, but I was like delirious, thinking this is it because I kept screen testing it, and thanks Jesus. to Kevin Hubane, that was like, but that's crazy. So I can't make these stories. Well, up. Let me ask you this though: um, Was there a time where you just were kind of like? Hey, I needed, I need, like, I, I was hooked on pills for a while because of my back. Were there times when you okay. were, had to go withdrawal and shit? Well, here's the thing because I was the perfect pain management patient at Cedar Sinai. Um, I had never gone through anything serious like this, but like, I, I went paralyzed my whole left, the whole right side of my body. And um, even like, even partial, like, temporary facial paralysis. Um, I was now damaged goods, um, and I got dropped from. I was biggest catalog selling artist. I, I ended up having to be dropped by my record label. I remember I was dropped by my agency, and I learned how horrible this business can be um, when you don't mean anything and you can't deliver. If you don't have something to give people, they don't need you anymore. They don't need you, and it's, that's it's all. Yeah, it's all very superficial. Take, you have to be tough to weather this business. You know, you people people mistake that my kindness is weakness. And my kindness to me is king because, you know, it's easy to be someone like the guy, the British guy who I sat next to and left me. But it's yeah, it's, that's it's, another. It's really, it's really, it takes love, it takes patience, it takes stick to itness and and the belief in talent to to be able to. To weather shit like that. And and so now when you go into acute pain, as you have experienced, you are now naturally addicted to whatever pain med pain medicine they're giving you. So I had never been on on drugs to, but I had nerve damage and structural damage. Mm -hmm. In order for your nerves to grow back, it's like watching paint dry or grass grow. It it's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. And I went through traveling the world and there was a brand new thing called stem cell research back mm -hmm. then. And I tried to get into trials all over the world. I went to Dusseldorf, I went to China, I was in Japan, I I went to Thailand, I, I was in Canada. I You've kept, done it all. I kept getting cut from the front. And each neurosurgeon said, I've got, I have these plates that are gonna be perfect for you. It never worked. I, I never get, works. I get fusilli like uh, scar tissue that would wrap around like a fusilli noodle around my spinal cord. It was one failed surgery after another. Rhizotomies, nerve, nerve, nerve burning, blocks, nerve blocks, stellate ganglion blocks. Like, right, you've had it all. So have I. Yeah, a lot so, of. Yep. So and the and here I am, in like ninety two pounds taking, taking drugs, mm -hmm. having to be on fentanyl patches. The the pain was on a scale of of zero to 10, 10 being natural childbirth, my my normal way of living for almost 17 years was seven and a half. Mm. And yet I never gave up. I always knew that the most powerful muscle in your body is your brain. If I could divert my brain away from the energy of focusing on pain. Maybe it, you could yeah, may, so heal it, yourself. And, but it was an up here, a total uphill. Oh yeah. You know, I disappeared for seven, seven years, a little like seven years, three month, three and a half months. You know, that's a long time to be away from the business. However, I had the biggest catalog, so I was a, the biggest ca catalog selling artist at the time with my debut album. So, but seven and a half years, you know, people go away and stuff, and I showed showed up on a brand new show called American Idol. And, and it was like you were, it was like yesterday they saw you. Here we are. Oh, yeah, it's Paul. And you became. Well, no, it was it was touted as going to be the most Velveeta cheesy show that's going to ruin I the music industry. I couldn't stop watching that show. It, I from, couldn't stop watching it for years. We became like the Death Star, like to every other network. If, if a network dropped 50% in all their ratings, we still were like 100%. <laughs> you know, it's funny because um, when I was doing Smallville, I remember them saying, oh, well, all our other shows, they were kind of tanking, so this is helping us break even. I'm like, what? It was just weird, so American Idol was that show. You know, the only thing I think about is I remember, like people remember how nasty Simon could be, of course, how sweet and lovable you are, and how laid back and cool Randy was. 
I just sounded like Morgan Freeman, by the way. Morgan Freeman. Oh, but you- I remember the first day I met Andy Dufresne. That's good. You're good. <laughs> but no, so when I look back, I remember going, why? He's so mean. Like, I know he stuck up for you a lot, too. What? Did he not? What are you smoking? <laughs> I thought I read somewhere where, like, when- I don't know, like he stuck up with you about the whole thing with the, the the guy, one of the contestants, and he had your back. So he didn't have your back. Oh my. I'm I, wrong. I'm wrong. I, I guess I you're watching the, a different version. So you didn't get along with him. Oh, it was like brother, sister, kind of like. When you say brother, sister, are you sugarcoating it? Because it was like half brother, half sister. I don't really know you. Half, I can't stand half you. Satan. <laughs> yeah. Half Satan. Yeah. Um, Satan. It was, it was probably the most difficult job, challenging job that I ever had in my career. Every day when you were on your way to work, were you having anxiety and stress because you had to deal with that? I, I'll tell you, I started the first season, the first month going to therapy once a week. When it was going eight times a week, there was something wrong. This, I'm telling you, I you never ever read about me being a partier, because I'm not. I've been working mm. professionally since I'm 17 years old. Right in real heavy situations with James L. Brooks, Oliver Stone, uh, you know. Rob Reiner. No, no, what's your name? Who directed Big? I didn't, that's, I knew what you said. There was a big mistake with that. They lied? It's not, I didn't choreograph Big. What ended up happening is I did a Diet Coke commercial with Elton and I danced on a piano. Yes, that's right. And then it was at that, then, then. That's what they think of it as. And so Big ended up, saying oh well there's a you know that right. must be a great scene uh so i it wasn't me it was just because it is because the doors the, real i did choreograph the doors and oliver stone is a historian it was a different kind of choreography that i said do i really have to do this but i turned val kilmer into jim morrison and because oliver stone is such a stickler for history i he gave me boatloads of tapes watching The Doors and watching Jim Morrison be drugged out of his mind, body surfing, tipping over. I had to recreate every nuance of how Jim Morrison stumbled, performed. One of the toughest jobs because Val Jeez. Kilmer also was just a natural genius. Was he tough to work with? It was not, it was not the most pleasant job for me. Um, because I'm dealing with an amazing actor who actually can sing. Like oh, I know, I know that whole sing. story, yeah. He okay. sent tapes to Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone didn't know who he was listening to and it was actually Val Kemmer singing the Doors songs. Oliver Stone was like, it was in between actors and it was, you work with these actors, tell me what, I mean, I'm 17 and a half, 18, 19 years old when I'm working with all these James L. Brooks and, and, and all these people being given tremendous responsibility oh, and me and me and all the while I remained as the Laker girl and, and choreographer Laker girl. because I was afraid I'd lose my day job. So I became the biggest choreographer, um, choreographing Janet Jackson and all this and other and stuff. Coming to America. A lot of people don't know that I choreographed the big African wedding scene and coming to America to this day. Was that big money when they asked you to choreograph stuff oh, like I that? Thought, I thought, did I just die and go to heaven? I cannot believe I'm making this kind of money. That kind of money for doing these big movies. Well, so you get paid, she gets paid by you probably worked for weeks on something. Yeah, because um I was given the responsibility. First of all, I was called in by John Landis to well, but let me get back to Oliver Stone. We're gonna get back to Simon Cowell just in a second, too. Go Have ahead. You, it's, this is a problem with my life story. It's a, you're coming back. There's too much to talk it's about. It's too much to talk about. I, I haven't even gotten I know, to, you know. But like, and the fact that my roommates, well, after I had, I lived with four Laker girls, I got them all their SAG cards and after, and I said, I, ha I have to hire other dancers. And they would, I'd have the, the old fashioned machine and you have the, the, you know, checking your messages. And I get to the two bedroom apartment and my Laker girl roommates are going, okay, um, George Michael's manager called, you need to be at Sony. Come on. I choreographed the Faith tour. What? Yes. And then um, Prince wants to meet with you. Uh, you're going to have to go to Sony. And um, you've got rehearsals with, uh, you've got the Tracy Allman show. That was a brand new show. You won an Emmy for that. Two Emmys from Shut that. Shut up. 
<laughs> Sorry. I'm a little shit. With, with, you with, are. I mean, I just, let's get, let, oh God, there's so much I want to talk to you about. So as, a, as someone who's interviewing you and talking with you. And Whoopi Goldberg was my roommate. <laughs> I just have to throw that in there. From four Laker girls to. How my, old were you when she was your roommate? I was 22 at the time. 22. Did she like you? I love Whoopi. Did she like me? She loved me. She hated my pug. Because the pug would jump in the pool. Jesus. All right, we, let me just ask you. You you jumped away. It was my fault, probably. Sorry, it's listeners. Okay. But listen, when you were talking about Simon, you said you got up to maybe going to therapy like eight times a day. <laughs> I'm joking, you're, you're but not joking. Really. But you, but like you know, it was. It I was, never experienced anything like that. What was it? Was it just when you saw him, you get anxiety? Well, he, were you intimidated by him? Because I think I'd be maybe intimidated by him. He won. A, a, you know, I have crazy stories and they're long and crazy and I tried not, to, but, but if I don't tell you how I got American Idol, which is the craziest story of, forget Laker girl. That's like a pimple on an elephant's behind compared to how I got. American are you, Idol. are you going, are you? Uh, I'm dive, Yeah. I'm Listen, you got to steer me here because I'm just there's saying, too much my life I'm story. saying about Simon, are you done talking about no, that? No, I'm not done talking about that <laughs> because it's how I got the job. So. Ryan, we're going to go a little over on this one. Great. It's, it's I, you know, too interesting. It's too, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll. No, it's, I just love it. Okay. I could talk to you forever. I didn't realize how I just always, when I met you, how I pictured you was just very, you know, you're not loud. I'm saying I can't think, <laughs> I, I can't think of a better word than sort of reserved and very, and you are and very uh, classy and all these things. But when you get going, you're like a kid and I, you, and you tell these stories and like, I just don't want these stories to stop, but um, it's awesome. So go ahead. Where do you, what do you want to talk about? Do you know? it, it's crazy. It's uh, crazy. I, tell me a short story. How you, how you became, got American Idol. Let me tell and you the shortest Simon way possible. Cowell. Go ahead. So I am literally in crying pain, quality of life sucks, in and out of surgery, after surgery, after surgery. Blowing sur money, money from all these surgeries and all this shit. Horrific quality of life, trying to divert my energy away from pain. All of a sudden, I'm in one of, the, I'm, I'm, I think I was in Canada when I got phone call because I, oh, I forgot to tell you, on my tw 12th surgery, a neurosurgeon cut me the wrong way and I got this, like it's called RSD, which is horrific. It's it's on the scale of natural childbirth, and it's horrible. Your body can't even. It's it's spinal cord injury. Your body can't handle the amount of pain. You break out in lesions, like like horrible shingles, right. open sores, and then whenever it wants to die down, it magically goes back in your skin as no scar. It was like the craziest pain, and every doctor, neurosurgeon, stayed away from you. Stay stay because it's there's no cure for it. Right. All right. So. At the worst and worst times of your while life. this is going on, I have a song and songs I had been working on, but I can't because he cut, when he did that, he also scraped my vocal cords. Now I don't even have a speaking voice, let alone singing. And Jeez. I can't, straight, I can barely walk now, tell me. and I couldn't dance. <laughs> Good so, Lord, bad joke. That's okay. It, was, I, it wasn't great. It wasn't, it wasn't great. great, but it was, it you know, sometimes I just, okay. uh, the 14-year-old in me comes out. Yeah, I get it. Uh, we'll cut it. The 13-year-old in me. <laughs> go ahead, um, go ahead. So, yeah, worst it. time of your life, your um, vocal cords, all these things, what happens? I was going to New York to meet with my publisher because now I'm in a predicament. I can't work. I can't, I can't, re I've recorded background vocals on certain songs. There was a song I, I won't, was working on that it was a retro disco type of feel song that I wanted to do about my divorce, okay? And it was, I wanted it to be fun, but it was a, like kind of like a, but it was a great dance record. Right. And I met, um, I remember saying, you know, to my publisher, can, can I sell some songs? And it, and I remember I was in pain and I, my publisher's greatest guy in the world, Evan Lamberg. And uh, he knew what I was going through. And it's just so weird because it was a rainy, rainy day. I had to get back to LA. I'm in terrible pain. And I go, Shh, I'm going to miss my flight. I can't get a cab. I got to call the hotel, book it. And I'm in the pouring rain. It, the wind chill factor, my umbrella's like torqued upside down, mm -hmm. broken. 
And I'm soaking wet. And this girl literally crosses the street, walks up to me and says, are you Paula after all? I said, yeah. And she goes, oh, yeah. She goes, my boss has a framed thank you letter from you. He has no thank you letters from any other artist. Yours is framed. I go, who do you work for? She goes, the president of Billboard magazine, Mike Ellis. I go, oh, my God. I remember writing him a letter because he gave me a really fair, equally pointed critique that from Madison Square Garden. I believe it was Madison Square Garden. And he pointed out real strengths that puts me in a lane of my own and real weaknesses that I'm aware of. And I learned how to get over the whatever bad, you know, review you get. You got to understand, you got to remove the things that you have no business even caring about. If they attack you on the personal level, um, it's none of your business. But the things- Things you can improve. You have to take- you Constructive have to, criticism. Constructive criticism. Right. And he was really- Equally fair, and I thought- And you this remember was, that. I remember that, and I, I wrote a handwritten thank you letter. She, I go, wow, I remember that. She, I go, what, are you on lunch break? And I, she goes, yeah. And I go, well, I'm missing my flight. You wanna have lunch with me? She goes, you're shitting me. I go, no. She goes, God, you really are the girl that you seem to be. And I said, Brooklyn Diner's right across the street. Let's have oh, lunch. Oh, I love the Brooklyn Diner. And I said, so are you- an aspiring singer songwriter she goes everyone is who works at billboard but we can't solicit ourselves and i go i hear you i go are you good she goes oh i'm damn good i went wow i go well you you said you live close can you bring me some of your demos she goes really i, I goes tell me what you want and on napkin i wrote what she wanted to eat she went she came back she goes i can't believe i'm doing this i listened literally Four bars in, I took the head the headphone off. I said, you are that good. I said, wow. I said, she goes, I go, I'm going to be coming back. I, she goes, where have, you, like, where, where have you been? I said, I explained to her. It's been a really tough road for me. Um, I've been, I sustained so many bad injuries and surgeries. And she was like, I go, but I, but I want to reserve three songs that I just heard because I will be getting a, a record deal. I will be doing that. She goes, are you kidding me? I said, no. I said, also, I wanna put it out there that if you really are serious about this, I will let you come and stay with me in LA. What? And I'll introduce you to writing camps and things like that. And I said, all, all I ask is that you give enough notice to Mike Ellis. If this, And two weeks later, she said, are you still willing to? I said, absolutely. And she gave enough notice to, Mike Ellis and Mike Ellis had said, of course it's Paula. I moved a complete stranger. Her name was Kara. I, okay, this is important. She comes to live with me. The first week she's living with me in my condominium in West Hollywood, I, from like a recommendation from Jim Brooks, from James L. Brooks, talking about a psychic, this woman and the, and you, you know, she's apparently great. You go see her. I had maybe been a couple of psychics in my life, not, and I, but it was like, I, uh, it was already paid for. And I decided to go. Okay. I decided to go. I said, Carrie, do you want to come with me? Sure. So it's this amazing woman named Dolores Catalucci, Italian broad, a woman who finds missing children and works for the police station. She's an amazing psychic. And she said, She's in Van Nuys, like in on Calvert Street. You stay in your car until I call you. When I call you, get, get out of the car. Well, obviously, because I saw Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston walking out of this house, like major people. Like, so you walk in, the first thing she does, is she goes, give me, a, give me a keys, give me jewelry, give me your phone, give me something. I, she disappears. Less than 30 seconds later, she comes back. She goes, put your tape recorder on, get your pet, start writing. And she starts spewing out a whole bunch of information. And she says, you've had a rough go at this. You're, you're going to be okay. It's, your health is going to figure itself out. You're going to be okay. Not without struggle. And she started talking to me about my dad and that my dad was going to develop dementia. And he did. And Alzheimer's. She told me that my sister is going to be in full remission from breast cancer. That happened. And then she told me, you're going to be doing 
a TV show. And I'm going, fantastic. And I'm thinking, okay, it's this MTV show that I pitched. <laughs> right. She goes, no, no, that's not that one. And she goes, look, she goes, it's a talent show. I go, well, like Star Search? She goes, I don't know, but it's it's going to be the biggest thing of your career. You think music's big? Really? She said all this? Not only did she say all of this, she went as far as telling me that I'm going to be sitting next to an a-hole from across the pond and a, and an African-American guy that you somehow know. I'm like, I'm not even paying attention because... I'm not, like, I'm not doing a talent That's show. That's crazy. Not doing a talent show. And she goes, honey, you willed it to happen. I, I can, I read from f f three years, from now to three years, and I, you willed it to happen. How long after you saw her did you get this call? Almost three years later. So, remember, oh, she asked me, do you want, do you want her to be in your reading? I said, I don't care. Yeah, fine. So, Kara was in the reading with me. I forget about all of this, I'm paying attention to my sister's health and my dad's health. Um, to watch your dad because he's going to start losing his motor skills and he's going to fall and, and break his ankle or something. And he did. It was just, it was sad. Things were happening. I didn't, I never paid attention to what she said. I had a tape recording of it. I had notes from it. And um, two and a half years later, weirdest thing, I get a phone call from my attorney and business manager saying, and my publisher. Because what I didn't tell you is when I missed my flight and I had to stay over another hotel, Kara worked on this a song for my post-divorce, the, the vintage, you know, retro disco song that I was doing. About Emilio Estevez? No. No. The the second one that I don't get to I don't even have to talk about because oh. it wasn't it was an old <laughs> it was another one it was an old but we we finished a song and that was how I'm and then two two and a half three weeks later she was living with me and she was in that reading with me and I I introduced her to different writing camps of people that I know um, she was a funny roommate uh, and the reason I'm telling you all this because you know my stories are crazy as they are. Two and a half years later, I get a call. I'm in a ho I'm I'm in a hospital bed, and my publisher first says this. Not my attorney. My publisher says, "Are you sitting down?" Little did he know, I was two days out of yet. Now my eleventh or twelfth surgery, thirteenth surgery. It was like towards the tail end of. I go, yeah. He goes, that song that you worked on with Kara. Um, I pitched it to an artist that was huge before you ever came out, Paula. But Australian girl, I go, Locomotion, Kylie McNogue. He goes, yes. She's on a very small label called London Beat Records and loves the song. And she removed scratch lead vocals. She put her lead vocal on. And he goes, Paula, it looks like it's going to enter the charts number one in the UK blessing Kara's first number one record it was with you for another artist that was given to Kylie Minogue it went number one in every territory except it wasn't released in one territory the United States a song called spinning around now that's the first number one for her for Kara and it's a, a, a renaissance for Kylie Minogue because now her world explodes to have the coming from when I hear underdog story, I'm like, give it, give it. I'm all about the underdog. Mm -hmm. Now, because of that, several months later, I get a call from my attorney and business manager going, Paula, uh, you need to sign off on licensing and mechanicals for the song that you did with Kara and this guy, Ira. And it's, um, it, it's, there's, it's for a show in the UK some kind of talent show. Nothing's going off in my brain. No Dolores Catalucci. And there was another psychic named Miss Faye out here who I saw that predicted the same exact thing, all within relatively one year time. Same thing, same people. All right, keep going with this. So now I'm going, oh. I go, can I get the number of the producer you're talking to? And my attorney, my publisher, everyone who's worked with me, my agent, they know I'm tenacious. 
I'm looking for a way to help these artists. I hear it's a talent show. And guess what? Every kid in this new UK show called Pop Idol is coming in and auditioning, singing a cappella, spinning around. The song that was went number one that from Kara, myself, and this guy Ira. Now, I call this woman. I keep getting hung up on because they don't believe it's me. It's not the, the Opalux, it's not you, Pula, that kind of stuff. And it's like, oh my God. And I keep calling. And finally, I, I just started humming straight up. And I could hear the phone. Ring. Oh, Pulex, it's her, it's her. And this woman, Claire Howell, got on the phone, who's the producer, and she went and on. I said, I would love to somehow get involved and help keep, sh I'm a choreographer. And I work with artists. I work with Michael for Jackson for six years. George Michael, I give signature. Let me work with, I'm thinking anything and everything I can to get away from, I'm in the hospital right now on my 12th surgery, 13th surgery. And she goes, oh my God, that would be fantastic. She goes, listen, we're at still- I thought at, she was English. Why, well, I, I, what, what accent am I doing now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, did I go into- No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, she, well, I'm back to the American because I'd like to save the British for a Simon. Um, she went on to say that, you know, we just begun, it's the biggest show in the UK. The queen clears her diary to vote. I went, what? Oh, oh yes, the country votes. I went, huh? She goes, and it's brutal. You know, everyone talks behind your back in, in America, but here, there are these two wretched guys. One is a big producer named Pete Waterman. I go, I know Pete, the Bananarama, Ace of Base, and this other guy who's an A&R executive named Simon Cowell. They're horrible. They make young men fall to their knees crying in embarrassment Jesus. because they, they tell you that you suck. I went, oh my God. And there's a really sweet girl in the middle who's a radio DJ and it's hosted by these two comedians. And I mm. said, I said, well, I would love to, she goes, listen, when we get down to the top 20 or top 12 or whatever, we'll fly you out here to work with the kids. I'm great. I, great. I go, in the meantime, can you send me any, any tapes? Cause I, I don't know what the show looks like. And later on, I got sent some tapes to look at and, um, I watched and I saw how wretched it was. I was like in shock. But I didn't hear back from Claire until I just accepted choreographing, even with, because the beauty of choreographing, I could be, God forbid, confined to a wheelchair, God forbid. You can still I do still it. can choreograph. And right. and my dancers know my lingo, my language. And I, you know, it's, it, that's a beautiful thing. And I was still coming out of surgeries and I just signed on to do Dana Carvey's uh, comeback movie after he had the wrong part of his body operated. Do you remember when? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. It was Master of Disguise. I just signed on. Principal photography, photography starting. I get a call from this woman, Claire Howell. We're ready to bring it to London. I said, I can't. I Darn, I can't. Just no worries, no worries. The show is the biggest show in the world. I bet you there's going to be a bidding war. We'll be, in, we'll be coming to America within nine months to a year. And they did. I forgot all about that. And then I get a call. It's almost two, it's almost three years to date. It's almost a year from when Claire Howell said she would call me. And I get a call from not Claire. After she after I said, you know, I can doing Master of Disguise. Almost a year later, I get a call from my from my uh, business manager and attorney saying, Fox is trying to get a hold of you. They want you to come down and an interview for a TV show. I go, what kind of TV show? Uh, it's it's their new division, like of reality shows, and like all that we knew about was was you all the weakest link. Like right. the Brit that was Ann Robinson, and that was the first brutal take on what <laughs> this was. Right. So I'm hearing it's a talent show. I don't put. I don't. I'm not thinking Dolores Cartolucci. I'm not thinking Miss Faye. I'm not thinking of the tapes. And, right. And so you go in. I go in and. Nigel Lithgow, there's like 18 people from Fremantle and producers and Fox producers. And, and did you have to audition or you just? No, I was called in. So I was called in and I'm not thinking about anything. And then I'm, then I hear it's, uh, there's a wretched guy named Simon Cowell and I'm still not putting two and two together. And then there is, there are these two 
uh, host. One is a DJ, radio DJ at Coast 103 FM. He's new, new guy named Ryan Seacrest. And, and this, this budding comedian that's won the Aspen Comedy Fest named Brian Dunkelman. And I'm, I'm just, I'm listening to all this. Oh, and that, and that, and then you're sitting in between Simon Cowell, the wretched guy, and an African American, uh, Randy Jackson, not the fat member of the Jacksons, but another fat member. Like <laughs> that's what they said. This is like I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm in, in shock. Right. He says it's not the member, not the fat member of the Jacksons, and I'm going. Does he not know that I worked with the Jacksons? Like how rude. And I'm going. This guy is bold. And then all of a sudden, bullets start flying. George Cartolucci, Claire Howell, Miss Bay. Oh shit. Simon Cowell, uh, like everything started. Made sense. Yet my heart is in my feet now because I willed this to happen. I willed this to happen. That's what I was told. How did I will this to happen? Nothing's making sense to me other than if this is supposed to be my job, why am I feeling so shitty? Right. And what ended up happening was I said, when is this job starting? Well, that's the thing, Paula. You got to pack your bags because in three days we go to our first city of auditions. Now I'm knowing it's it's that pop idol show. Oh my God! Every but why does this feel so bad? I said, when is it starting? Three days. I said, you know, I'm really sorry, but I have fiduciary responsibilities that I bought. And I said, I wish I would have known earlier. And I'm dying inside because I'm still thinking of, right. the, of the missiles Insults, that are going on. Right. It's never enough. It's like the, there's just some stupid. There's an old show called Eight Is Enough. I remember Eight Is Enough. Right, and there was a, and I, 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 I wrote him. this script that got sold but never got made. But I remember the two kind of has-beens on the show that I wrote. I love has-beens because well, they're they're guys that had been something and they're not, and they're looking at the TV. And he's like, Willie Ames, who's an actor on that mm-hmm. show, Eight Is Enough. He goes, Willie Ames, man, whatever happened to Willie Ames? He's like, dude, he did Charles in Charge. He did this. He did this. Isn't that enough? And I go, eight is enough. That's just a really stupid moment. But it's so true how you could be famous and do all these things. And all of a sudden, where is, where's that guy? Where's, where's she now? Why isn't success success? Because you're, you're taught in this business that you No, are, fuck that. Change it, the it, it stigma. Change the trajectory of it. If you were successful, you've made it. A hundred percent. Not you were famous. You uh, made that's, it. That's the way... These, the nah, business bastards. wants to make you feel, but the truth of the matter is, you got to believe in yourself. You got to, you got to stand in that light and know, hey, I, I broke the odds. I, I'm in, I'm in the less than one percentile who. Oh my god! Able, you know what I mean? It's like you're, you're like when, when I told my friends Paul Abdul's come to the house to uh, to interv- be interviewed. They're like, what? I interview so many people, and they're like, oh, that's cool, dude. Really? Oh, cool, man. And sometimes I get really key for Sutherland. That's cool. But when I said Paula Abdul, they're like, you're fucking kidding me right now. Like you're like, just to have a name, Paula Abdul, like what you've done and what you've accomplished. I hope you know, and you should know that it's just like, that's enough. Oh, that is, uh, you have done. I've done so mu- crazy. crazy All right, listen, this has been the longest interview I've ever done. I'm really sorry. No, it's not. But, but the but thing listen, is, is my life story is no little. No, it's, it's, we're gonna uh, had iterations. You don't understand. I've already thought of filming this movie called okay. Paula, and the movie starts out with narration. And hang on, and then you see this little girl. She's like, I had, I was born prematurely. I had this, blah blah blah. I had this breathing thing when I inhale, blah blah. blah. And all of a sudden, it shows you pa- going up. Oh, I, I got three to one says she's going to pass out before she gets to the, and it shows you this little girl in these leotards and boom, passes out. And then she passes out somewhere else. And it shows you rapidly growing up and all that shit. I can see it. My last question to you, and and we got to make it short is just because I want to talk to you again, because you're awesome to talk to, but <laughs> when it, the Simon Cowell stuff, you, you didn't really get into that other than you had anxiety and things like that, but just, if you can, kind of like, did you ever get through that with him? Did you ever confront each other and kind of make it cool? Was there ever a moment where like, I can't, I can't work with him. I'm not going on stage. I'm not doing this. Kind of wrap that up. You know, it's like, look, I've been working since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And I've been working in really high pressure adult. You know how to situation. deal with it. But I'd never gone. First of all, reality TV live, live, live 
was a brand new thing. So it's it's an it's awkward, it's intimidating. You don't know. I had to learn, oh my God, if we're typing in front of a live audience, they can alter and edit my words to not even I, I'll never forget having entertainment tonight in my house, in the living room with my family. And I can't wait because I work for entertainment tonight. I'm going, guys, wait till you hear what Simon says and how I defend this amazing girl. They cut it. I, I, I had, I was saying, like, this is the most insane statement you could ever make. That all you have to say is you look like a fat version of Jessica Simpson. How can you say that? She Th said that he said that? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And that was cut. And all of that's cut. And this is what you see. You're so pretty. Those I had son to, of a bitches. Well, but you know what? The truth of the matter is, I've always been the girl that I am. I mean, you are an idol. And you are amazing. And it's fun meeting you at the, this con that I met you at. And it was your first con. Uh -huh. And it was in Pittsburgh. And I see you just so many people over there. And you're signing autographs. And you're making so many people happy. Do you get anxious at these cons or do you feel do you love being around the fans is it something new to you and that you want to experience more i i'm a people person um obs obs <laughs> as you are too um i love being able to meet people that have like so richly honored me and and paid paid honor and respect and and have been there as fans for so long it's overwhelming when you see in a, mm. you're, you're kind of sandwiched in it in the area and your back's against the wall and all of these people it's and you're up close and personal with them it's it's a little overwhelming it's, overwhelming. it's a little overwhelming sure. but it was it was a great gift because anytime i can connect and and make a difference and, and be present to acknowledge these amazing people who have stood behind, by, by me yeah. and beside me it's awesome well look I mean, there's some, you're coming back. Will you come back? You asked me about my life story. Do you know Richard Branson, who signed me? By the way, I was one of the first four artists that Richard Branson signed. And Virgin Records was a studio apartment on Sunset and Doheny. They signed Roy Orbison, Steve Winwood, a group called The Cutting Crew. Ugh, and, love Cutting Crew. And, and Paul Abdul. Paul Abdul. <laughs> um, for like, I knew I'm the underdog. I, I know this position very well. Right. Throw me up against the wall, see if I see if it sticks. And when I tell you the ROI of what they gave me and what they would say, oh, the airline that Paula built. Oh, the Frank Lloyd Wright buildings that Paula built. The Mercedes and the Rolls Royce that Paula. It's like the joke was that within a year and a half time from like, under a hundred thousand dollars to do an entire album, which I bartered deals on, and said, "Prince, I'll you write the song for me. I'll choreograph." Just Jackson's, making deals to get things made, at, and teaching cheerleading camps and dance camps, and just to make ends meet, to make your dreams come true. And you know what? Um, in a year and a half, Roy Orbison died that year and sold a million albums at a platinum record, and Steve Winwood. Uh, I think sold a million albums. And then I broke records as a debut artist, um, the biggest, biggest album. And and by the wow. way, everyone says, well, cause she's a video artist. Well, people, the truth is, is that my, all of my songs went number one and I was scrambling to catch up and make a video. That's why my album stayed on the charts, record breaking amount of time, because I had number one songs and I had Three weeks later or a month later would come a video, which prolonged the success of my Wow. Life. Well, look, I, lo I love the story. You've done, we're going to get into it, but it's like your residency in Vegas, your jewelry, your, your gear, you have a, a clothing. We don't, I mean, there's so many things. You go to your Instagram, there's just like, it's, it's, it's endless. Oh, and you want to know the, the groove gear collection, right? Yeah. And you have these glasses. Do you want to hear the craziest thing? No artist can say, that. like, no, no. Um, so Richard Branson signs me. Success beyond success. Uh, last April, I got a call from Richard Branson's office and, and Richard wanted to know if I'd give him permission to name his next rocket straight up. I went, watched the rocket get built. I was there, I filmed. I actually saw 
my rocket straight up take launch on <laughs> July 1st. Who gets to say that? That is beautiful. Well, look, this has been a damn joy. I'm going to hold you to it. You're going to come back and we're going to talk more. This is uh, this is awesome. Thank you so much. This has been great. This has been really, really fun and great for me too. So thank you. And we never, we we made the time because we don't, we usually do them in the morning, Mm -hmm. late morning. Mm -hmm. But this was kind of like a Friday early evening special before the weekend gets started. It's it's like the jazz session. Yeah, (laughs) I like it. All right. I love you. Thanks for coming here. Love you too, honey. Thank you. Ah, I loved it. She was so sweet. But you know, after that, she's like, text me, we'll go out to dinner. And she never texts me back. <laughs> I thought we we're gonna have, I'm gonna have dinner with Paul Abdul. Paul Abdul's busy. Paul Abdul that's, has been busy for a long Abdul time. Shit, <laughs> that's Abdul shit, man. That's Abdul shit right there. Uh, thank you, Paul, for coming on the show. I love you. You're fantastic. You're beautiful. You're a talent that needs to be recognized and is recognized. And um, just so much going on with her. Um, she said she'll come back on and talk more about Simon and stuff. So that was fun. Uh, if you want to listen to any of the other stuff that I mentioned in the intro, do it inside of you online store, patreon.com slash talkville. And uh, one of the perks for the patrons is I get to give shout outs to your names, to all my favorite people here. Uh, if you want to become a patron, uh, support the podcast. We need you. Here we go. Nancy D, Leah S, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E, uh, Brian H. Nico P, Robert B, Jason W, Sophie M, Raj C, Joshua D, Jennifer N, Stacy L, Jamal F, Janelle B, Mike E, Eldon Supremo, Raj, and other horror people. I think Leanne likes horror, and uh, there's some others that like horror. Brian Hinnenkamp, um, Nico. But there's this movie called I, I See You. It's on Netflix. I, I had fun with it. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of problems with it, but it, it was kind of fun. I, I kind of liked it. Uh, the movie Air is awesome, by the way. Go see Air. Oof, gosh. 99 more. Santiago M. Santiago, the uh, the bust here is awesome. If you guys can see that in the distance, it's a Smallville bust. Ryan, you want to hold that? So Santiago made this bust, and it is just freaking fantastic. And he's also making me some inside of you like uh, figures that I'm going to put on the site. It's uncanny. I mean, look at that. Oh. It's kind of creepy looking at myself. All right, there you go. Be careful, it'll break. Chad W, Liam P, Janine R, Maya P, Maddie S, Belinda N, Dave H. Hello, Dave Hole. How are you, mate? I love you, man. Sheila G, Brad D, Ray, Hada da, Tab of the T, Tom N, Liliana A, Tagia M. Oh, these names. That's their family. Betsy D, Chad L, Angel M, Ryan and C, Corey A. K, Deb Nexon, Michelle A, Jeremy C, Brandy D, Joey M, Eugene and Leah, Corey, Heather L, Jake B, Megan T, Angela F, Mel S, Orlando C, Caroline R, uh, Christine S, Eric H, Shane R, Andrew M, Tim L, Karina N, Amanda R, Jen B, Kevin E, Stephanie K, Jor L, Jam and J, Leanne J, Luna R, Cindy E, Mike F, Stone H, Miss S, Brian L, Katie B, Aaron R, Aaron R, uh, Kendall L, I love the newbies too. House J, Meredith I, Charlene C, Kara C, Mary R, Sheena L, Jessica B, Kyle F, Marisol P, Estevan G, Kaylee J, Megan K, Mickey L, and Brian A. Could not do this podcast without you, guaranteed. So thank you for your love and support. And uh, I love you. And uh, from the Hollywood Hills in Cal- Southern California, Southern Michael, California. Ro- Michael Rosenbaum. I'm right there. Right there. Southern says. California. Right there. A little way to the camera. We love you guys. Please, please, please be good to yourselves. Be good to yourselves. Mm-hmm.